now we're ready to go. So I did write the test and uh, I wrote the solutions to the test, so it is a reasonable test. A lot of extra credit parts. And you might ask, how much are the extra credit parts worth? Uh, I didn't put on the test what they're worth. I think problem one, the extra credit part is going to be worth a little bit more than the other extra credit parts. Cause it's a little bit harder problem. It's definitely doable though, and you can, it's doable. You just have to do more work by going through the chapter one of the text. Pretty much. I mean, define a space and then ask you to prove that it's complete. And uh, you can pretty much copy that out. So, um, so email me or ask me in class more about what the problems are worth. Other than that, they're going to be equally weighted. Um, <clears throat> and the last two problems are pretty much in this last material, and they're more like closer to homework problems. So they're not quite as... Uh, Well, I try to make more, each problem more of a, a little bit of a project, uh, but uh, a couple of these problems more, look more like, at least the very last one, more like a homework problem. It is a homework problem. It is out of the book. And none of those problems are real bad. These are just not real, real bad problems. But they may take a little bit more time. So I gave you two weeks, March 21st due date. <clears throat> okay. Other questions or comments now? Hi, Joyce. Hi. Let me give you this stuff. Okay. Here's your paper your, and uh, solutions in a test. I mentioned there's a bunch of extra credit on the test. And the first, ex, the first problem has a little bit, there's going to be a little bit more weight on that extra credit part. I don't think I got solutions to that. Oh, you didn't get the solutions. Uh, I have more, plenty more stuff. Hmm. Oh, and there's the, re there's the updated syllabus. It's not that exciting. <laughs> I didn't give you solutions. Let's see. Did I give uh, an extra copy to somebody? Yeah, that's when I got mine. Oh, okay, sorry. Maybe you put the solutions away already. <laughs> no. It's <laughs> possible. Let's have a look. Okay. No, I must have another one here somewhere. Okay. Okay, other questions while I'm looking for that? Uh, solution for Matt. No, I had a bunch of them. I had five. Well, I'll have to get you one after class or something. Homework six. Did I get someone two copies? Thought I had an extra one. Okay. Just misplaced it. Sorry about that. Well, let's go on and get the rest of the risk representation theorem and the adjoint operator. Um, today, and let's see if we can finish this material uh, on chapter three. I try to watch all your lectures over, but my computer won't. I don't know what it you won't download it? No, something about that. I don't know. Maybe I can watch it here. Yeah, you could. Here, yeah, kind of you might want to check it out. Um, there's a downloadable format. This is the one you want to use. Has anybody else tried it? Yeah, it worked fine for me. If I used the downloadable, I didn't try to stream it or anything. I think there was like, there was like the downloadable stuff. Was this a long time ago? No, it was, <coughs> it 
for Thursday's lab. We saw you wanted to get a joke on <laughs> what we were doing. <laughs> I want to see the mistakes he was doing on the board. <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> okay. So, um, all right. So let's talk about sesquilinear forms. That's too bad if you can't get it. Um, I had trouble at first until they came up with this downloadable thing, but you have, you might need a... Uh, broadband or something. If you've got dial, do you have dial-up? I think I don't. Maybe I don't have an updated version or QuickTime or something. That might be. Yeah, you need that QuickTime I 7. The, yeah. The audio, but no video, and without the video, it wouldn't okay. be Okay. Yeah, it does take a little, you know, it might take half an hour or so to download the new QuickTime. Yeah, it pretty much needs that, so. Okay. What's a sesquilinear form and reach representation? You're going to have a little bit about sesquilinear forms on the exam, so what is one of those things? Um, I'm just going to give an example. And you're going to have other examples to do. Okay. Example, uh, let um, H be a Hilbert space. And let F and G be fixed bounded linear functionals on H. Um, and define um, just uh, H uh, from the Cartesian product of the Hilbert spaces back to the field of scalars by um, H of X and Y equal to simply F of X times G of Y conjugate on the G of Y, okay? This is an example simply an example of a sesquilinear form. And let's verify some of the properties that are uh, defined in uh, display 3 and 4, page 191. Uh, displays 3 and 4, I believe is the definition of what a sesquilinear form is. We were talking, last time Travis was saying, isn't that the one and a half linear sesquilinear? <laughs> what it means is it's going to be linear in the first argument and conjugate linear in the second argument. And it's going to be uh, of, a, of a bounded, actually of a bounded sesquilinear form. Because there can be just sesquilinear forms and also bounded ones. Okay, so there's just a sesquilinear form, and then the three is the the definition of the sesquilinear form, and this is the bound four is the boundedness <coughs> definition. Okay. Okay. So what what are the, what are the properties it's going to have? The linearity. Let's check the linearity. Check. Uh, 3 A through D H191 what do we have? We need to check that H of X1 plus X2 and Y is equal to H of X1 and Y plus H of X2 and Y. What is so show that? So let's see. That is according to this example all right would be F of X1 plus X2 G of Y conjugate F is linear, so that simply comes out to be equal to F of X1 plus F of X2 times G of Y conjugate. Okay. I decided to put an example here, just sort of a prototypical example, just to make it clear what the thing is. And then this would be equal to um, F of X1 times, all I'm just doing is multiplying out. So 
so that's equal to h of x1 comma y plus h of x2 comma y. Oh, that's pretty simple. All right, so that was easy. And the rest of these properties are easy to check. And the next one is that it should be uh, respect sums in the second argument. This is b. should be that h of x comma y1 plus y2 is equal to h of x comma y1 plus h of x comma y2. Is that still true? Well, if I put f of x and then g of y1 plus y2, g is linear. And then I put the conjugate sign, so I'll get f of x times g of y1 plus g of y2 conjugate. But the conjugate of a sum is a sum of conjugates. Conjugation respects addition and multiplication. So this is simply f of x, g of y1 conjugate, plus f of x, g of y2 conjugate, which is what I want it to be, h of x, comma, y1, plus h of x, comma, y2. So see, that property is checks. The third property is that it should uh, scale in the first argument. So h of alpha x and y would simply be f of alpha x, g of y conjugate. That would simply be alpha f of x, g of y conjugate, because f is linear. And so that's equal to alpha h of x and y. Fourth property is that it should be, uh, the scaling should be with a conjugation in the second argument. So h of x and beta y will be f of x, g of beta y conjugate. G is linear, so I get the beta coming out under the conjugate sign. f of x, beta g of y, that product conjugated, so we get f of x times beta bar g of y conjugate, which is beta bar h of x and y. Okay, those, that's the properties of the sesquilinear form. If, of course, the, um, the field of the hill, if it's a real Hilbert space, then all the conjugates are out and it's just bilinear. Okay. Now, one of the, the, the claim is that uh, in one of your homework, well, it's one of the homework problems, it's also one of the, a piece of one of your exam problems, is it shows the inner product on the Hilbert spaces itself, a sesquilinear form. It's pretty, pretty easy to see but also that it should be a bounded sesquilinear form. So let's talk about the boundedness part of it. So let's look at four. Okay. Also, by the way, any linear combination of these products would obviously also be a sesquilinear form. Okay. <clears throat> Check four. So what am I going to have for the bound? The norm of H is in general defined to be the supremum over, because we have the scaling, I can just take vectors of norm one. The conjugate is not going to affect norms or absolute values. So take the supremum over all X of norm one or Y of norm one, uh, absolute value H of X and Y. Okay, and that's going to be the norm of the sesquilinear form. In this case, what does that come out to be? That's the soup in our example. That's the supremum over all vectors of norm x of norm 1, y of norm 1. And by the way, this doesn't have to be on the same Hilbert space, or even doesn't have to even be a Hilbert space. Okay. Here I've just taken H to be Hilbert space because that's going to be the context for most of it. For that sesquilinear form, I only need inner product space. And they don't have to be the same inner product space either. Two different inner product spaces. So please look at the definition. I'm not giving the full definition in these notes because it's in the book. <laughs> okay. So here's an example of a sesquilinear form. Soup, uh, let's see, in this case, that's F of X. Uh, 
G of Y conjugate, absolute value, but absolute value is going to take care of the G of Y. What's that going to happen? Well, this, uh, because this is a product, this, this double soup is simply going to be a product of soups. This is going to be simply the soup norm X equals to 1 F of X times soup norm Y equal to 1 G of Y, which is simply the norm of F times the norm of G. So in this example, we're actually able to compute the norm of H. In other examples, you may only be able to get an inequality. But in here, we can at least compute it. OK. <clears throat> So again, uh, for for general sesquilinear form, what I have is that I've got H is mapping a product of inner product spaces to the field of scalars. We're assuming the same field for each inner product space, at least that much. Okay, okay, and. Uh, satisfied three, page one ninety one. Okay, the boundedness, as in this definition here. Okay, this is the general definition of boundedness. Okay, this this H should be finite. We assume that F and G were both bounded, so this will be a product of bounded numbers, which is finite. Okay, comments about this. So what what is this leading to? What it's leading to is as a general discuss, is a general uh, formula for the adjoint operator. <clears throat> so we talked a little bit about adjoint matrices last time, okay, uh, which I followed up pretty royally. But we'll we'll get back to it, okay, and make sure everybody understands it. Um, actually, none of the calculations I don't think I was doing wrong is just they weren't coming out the way I wanted them. So. <laughs> well, almost not wrong. <laughs> Depends what you're called wrong. I was pretty confused for a while. Okay, so. Why don't we uh, now get the 3-8-4. Okay. So 3.8-4, assume that H, you have a product of Hilbert spaces, because their H is, and, uh, is, a, is a bounded sesquilinear form. Okay. Fix X in H1 and define, well, for each fixed X, let's put it this way, for each fixed X, do I want fixed? Yeah, they'll do it that way. Fixed X in H1, define G of Y is a linear functional on H2 to be equal to H of X and Y conjugate. Okay, this is for Y in H2. So what I'm going to do is basically uh, consider the linear functional G of Y here, just similar as that other example. In other words, I'm going to get the G of Y back right, by conjugating up to a uh, Const, uh, up to a constant of proportionality, namely the f of x. This is going to define a linear functional on H2. Okay? I have a linear functional there. For each fixed x, I could call it g sub x, right? g sub x, if you want to call it. Okay? And all I'm going to do is apply the Reese representation theorem, 
the original one we had. If I've got a linear functional on a Hilbert space, it can be represented as by inner product. So write by 3.8 dash 1 that g sub x of y is equal to the inner product of y into some element z sub x. So z sub x is in something in um, H2. Okay, this is the inner product in H2. There's an inner product in each Hilbert space. Presumably, there, well, there could be two different Hilbert spaces here. Okay. I want to keep track of that. All right. So that's an inner product. Now, after taking conjugates again, now take conjugates. So that flips these, right? But it'll take the conjugate off the H. So I get H of X, Y equals Z sub X, Y, which I'm going to call Z sub X, I'm going to call that S of X for some function S mapping uh, H1 now to H2. So now I'm thinking of, it's true for each fixed X, but now I'm going to think of X, each X giving, generating a Z sub X, which I'm also going to call now SX. The reason for the multiple notations <laughs> is that uh, I have to call it Z because that was in 3.8-1, the Reese representation there for linear functional. And I want to call it also SX. So what I have is that I know that the norm of this G, the norm of G sub X, also by Reese representation, was equal to the norm of z sub x, which is the norm of sx. Okay. And this sx is, is unique. Okay. In that way. So I have h of x, y this way. All right. So suddenly I had my, I had my h of x, y, and now um, I have h of x, y as, as sx inner product with y. Okay, represented in terms of the inner product. Okay. Now, what are the properties of S? I claim that S is a linear and bounded operator and that its norm is equal to the norm of H. I think that's how it goes. Yeah. Let's double check that it's linear and all that stuff. It's all very simple to check. Um, Okay, it's all really simple to check. So this is this is going to be the conclusion of 3.8-4. Let's see what read it out. What 3.8-4 says. 3.8-4 says that H1 and H2 be Hilbert spaces in this operation. Be a sesquilinear form. Let this H be a sesquilinear form. Then H has a representation HXY equals SXY where S is a bounded linear operator, S is uniquely determined by H and has norm equal to the norm of H. <coughs> to show S is a bounded linear operator with um, norm of S equal to the norm of H well and unicity is pretty obvious because if I had an, uh, another uh, if I had this equal to TX and y for all x and y, then by taking y equal to s minus c, there's the uh, strange thing. If this, let's check the unicity now. If I could have, could I have this equal to tx comma y for some linear operator t, right? Well, then what I would do, and this is for all x, for all y, okay, this is in, uh, in the h2 norm, uh, for all x in h1, for all y in H2, if that was true, okay, 
And what would you have then? You'd have by difference, and you get SX minus TX inner product Y equal to zero for all X and H1 for all Y and H2. Well, now, if I'm assuming that S and T are both linear operators and they're mapping into, I'm assuming that S is mapping H1 to H2, and also T would map H1 to H2. So this would be something in the Hilbert space H2. I could just, and since this is equal to zero for all Y and H2, I could just make Y equal to that. That means SX minus TX would equal, the inner product of itself would equal to zero. This is the basic trick that gets used over and over for the unicity argument. That would be true, it would be equal to zero, therefore S of X would equal TX for all X. In H1, so that would give that if and only if S is equal to T. All right, so there's only, um, one operator, okay, that's going to have these properties. Okay. So that's the unicity. Questions about that? The same it's got a, you're going to have h of x. You're going to represent h of x, y in this way, and if, they, if you represented it in that way with any other operator, then uh, the operator would have to be equal to the original. Because, let's see, if, if I could get this inner product right equal, then uh, by differencing, uh, that would be zero for all y in particular, fixing x. So in particular, now I take y equal to this number here, because I'm assuming that sx and tx are both in h2. <laughs> That's a good old linear space. I can take that difference. That's still a good element. Okay, <laughs> h2, I can just make y equal to that, all right? Equal that. Choose y equal to that, then I get this equal to zero, which means that, of course, uh, the vector itself, sx minus tx, must be zero. Or that s is, it says that's true for every x, then it's the same operator. Okay? All right. So, I think I'll, any, any comments about that? I'm going to erase this now. That's, that's, we think we had, pretty much we had that argument before, but you're going to see, it. there's a little lemma in the book. I think it's 3.h-2. Uh, equality that summarizes this argument, okay? So here's what it remains to show, that S is bounded linear. How do I show S is, bound, is, is linear, at least, okay? How do I show the linearity? Okay, so all I have to do is kind of track through. Because, let's see, suppose I have G of Y, G of G, let's put G1 of Y equal to um, Y and S of X1. G2 of Y equals the inner product of Y with S of X2. Okay, so I've got these two different linear functions. If I go back to the G, okay, which is ahead right here, okay? where z sub x was the s of x. z sub x equals sx in h2. Okay. So I've got this g. I'm going to take x1 and x2. And I've got two different functionals. Okay. Now what's their sum? g1 plus g2. Okay at y is simply going to be equal to uh, y inner product of s of x1 plus s of x2. Now, I don't know that s is linear yet. I want to show that it is, okay? But also, this g1 plus g2, what do I have is this. I have, um, but also, because H is linear in the first argument, I have the G, if I call this G of Y, for the sum of these two linear functionals, just call it G of Y. 
Okay? So I generate these two linear functions using x1 and x2 in my original definition. Okay? So I have g sub x, g sub 1 is g sub x1 of y equals the conjugate of h of x1 and y. <coughs> As a function of y, that's a linear function. And I can represent it this way s of x1 in here. Okay? And I do the same thing with g2. Now, look at the sum of those linear functionals. That's a linear functional. And of course, it's represented this way simply by these formulas, by adding up. Well, the inner product is linear in the second argument. Or conjugate linear, <laughs> sorry. Okay, but also now g of y is equal to um, h of x1 plus x2 comma y is that right? Uh, conjugate because of the linearity of h, by linearity of h. Uh, let's see. Well, let's put it this way. To get this all straight, this is h of x1, y, conjugate, plus h of x2, because I'm just adding the two formulas. Okay. That I can put these together as h of x1 plus x2, comma, y, conjugate. Okay. So therefore, that's equal to, according to the representation, this reef representation, that's y comma s of x1 plus x2. Okay, therefore I have, on the one hand, y inner product sx1 plus sx2 equal to y inner product s of x1 plus x2 for all y in my Hilbert space h2. By the same argument, therefore, that I just was showing before, I get the s of the 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 thing the s of x one plus s x two is equal to the s of x one plus x two. Again, by this lemma, three point eight dash two. S x one plus s x two equal to s of x one plus x two. So I've just added, using the, the uh, additivity of the inner product on the right side to this definition. So going back to the definition, I've also written it this way. But then because h is additive, it's this way. And by the representation we had already developed, you get this way. OK. So that's just tracking through, like I said. And now I'll try the, line, the linear, the uh, scaling property. How do I do that? So I have to take alpha x. So you find g sub alpha of y equal to the inner product of y with um, uh, s alpha x. Okay. On the one hand, Well, let's see. well, on the one hand, on the other hand, it's also equal to um, h of alpha x y bar. Okay, so it's written two different ways, right? Because this is the original way we defined. Um, I'm replacing x by alpha x and looking at the linear functional that I get by taking the conjugate of this h with the, the x part and then the y. Okay, as a function of y. I can write it this, this linear function this way, or I can write it as s applied to alpha x uh, on the right side of the inner product, right? Because that was the representation. So now, pull this thing out. This is equal to, because of the linearity of h in the first argument, this is going to be alpha bar h of x, y bar, okay? So that's going to be an alpha bar. Now I'll put this as back as y inner product sx. Okay, that's what the uh, linear functional is written as. But now if I want to put the alpha bar back in, if I put it on the right side of this inner product, then it's the, the bar is going to go off. Right? So this is equal to y, inner product y with alpha sx. And again, 
you have these expressions equal for all y, therefore s of alpha x is alpha sx. Okay. I should have done that one first, maybe. <laughs> okay. Therefore, uh, s of alpha x equals alpha sx. Okay, so it's a linear operator. All this stuff just comes out for free, as you can see. Is it bounded? You have, I'm going to use this now. Okay, down here. That the norm of G sub X was equal to the norm of SX. So what is the norm of S? The norm of S is equal to the soup over all vectors of norm 1 of norm of s of x. But that, as we said, was equal to the soup over all vectors of norm 1 of this g of x. And g of x was simply this, okay, the norm of this, so uh, the norm of g of x. So what is the norm of g of x? gx is a linear functional, which is a function of y. So this norm gx is itself a soup of all vectors norm y equal to 1 of whatever the value of g of y is, which in this case is the absolute value of h of x and y conjugate. All right? And now, that's now a double soup. Uh, and so you get obviously equal to the norm of h. Okay. So that's it. QED for this problem. All right. So we got 3.8 3 dash 4. Now, on the notes, I, at this point, I go to the exercises. I want to talk a little bit about reese representation and so on, but I'm going to skip that for now. I'm going to come back. Uh, and I want to talk about the Hilbert adjoint operator now. We get the adjoint operator and get its properties so that you can do your problems. <laughs> okay, on that. Okay. Questions about this? So we've taken any sesquilinear <laughs> form on a uh, Cartesian product of Hilbert spaces and represented it as uh, an inner product. Sx comma y. All right. Now, let's play with this a little bit more. Suppose now we define another sesquilinear form using the inner product. I'm going to define this. And of course, the author's got this all set up so it's exactly everything. He's not going to mess up his x's and y's like I did. Hilbert had an operator. <laughs> okay, follow this program. A, define the following. Define, you have, to, you have to play with it a little bit in order to give it come out the way he wants to come out. Define H of Y and X. I'm going to switch the order of the variables here on H2 cross H1, okay, by the following formula. So I'm going to take a specific example and I'm going to take it to be H of Y and X equal to the inner product of y with uh, some operator tx, where t is mapping, is a bounded linear operator from h1 to h2, bounded linear operator. So given a bounded linear operator t, from h1 to h2, I define this form which is sesquilinear, but now linear in y and conjugate linear in x. It's still the linear in the first argument and conjugate linear in the second. Why is it conjugate linear in the second? Well, because t is linear, okay, and the second side of the um, inner product is conjugate linear. Okay? So that's going to be a good sesquilinear form. Now I'll just apply the Reese representation 3.8-4 that we just did. 
Okay. According to that, what you could do, let's see, I just erased it. You had that a, you had that h of x and y. Let's see what it said. It said 3.8-4 basically said that if I take any sesquilinear form, x in the first argument, y in the second argument, that I can write it as some linear operator on x into y, like that. Okay. Where s mapped uh, h1 to h2, the, where h, here, this was, uh, little h was mapping h1 cross h2 to k. All right. Well, now the roles of h1 and h2 are going to be reversed because I've got my h on h2 cross h1. Okay. I got my h on h2 cross h1, so I have to switch this role. So now the s is going to be mapping h2 to h1. Okay. But it's still going to take the first, it's going to take whatever the first argument here is and apply a linear operator to it. Okay, so I'm going to be able to write this, therefore, as some operator, linear operator, onto y. Okay, and just leave x as it is. All right, so I'm going to say this, this, this thing can always be written as just, just forget that it looks like this for the moment. Okay, that it looks like t star y into x where T star maps H2 to H1. Okay? Forget that it looked like this. Now I'll take my hand away and say, okay, this is equal to that now. Okay? Of course, this, this, capital, this H was depending on capital T. All right? Okay. Or this. And where... Let's see, now there's something more here that I'm having that the norm of T star is equal to the norm of H sub T. But what is the norm of H sub T? I claim that the norm of H sub T is just equal to the norm of T. Claim H sub T norm equals the norm of T. That's not too difficult to check. Um, in fact, you probably have to do something like that on your exam. Let's see. Let's check it. Um, that is a soup over all vectors of norm. I don't know if it's exactly the same, norm y equal to 1. But you're going to have to follow some of these arguments a little bit the same. Just go through this again for yourself, I think, on the exam. One of the exam problems. Um, and you take the, at the norm of y, see the absolute value of y tx, right? claim this. Okay, so I'm claiming this, and this is the norm of h sub t. The norm of h sub t is, in fact, here, the norm of h sub t is equal to, well, let's put in d. Indeed, the norm of h sub t is equal to this. Okay, now what I'm going to do, use Cauchy-Schwartz, right? I always use Cauchy-Schwartz when you've got an inner product, okay? And, okay, you always get a less than or equal to, right? But you can always, okay, you can get a less than or equal to, therefore, the soup norm x equals 1, norm y equals to 1, of norm y times norm tx. Okay. You already saw this linearity argument. Okay. Okay, well, the soup on x now is equal to the norm of t, right? So actually, this breaks out as a product because uh, this is a product here. So I have, this is quite easy, so that um, I get less than or equal to norm of y is 1, 1 times, and the rest of the soup is, is the norm of t. So I get less than or equal to the norm of t. But can I make equal to the norm of t? So I have the norm ht is less than or equal to the norm of t. Now I want to show that it's equal to the norm of t. Like, no, it can't be any bigger, so all I have to do is show that it comes up to the norm of t. Right? But now put 
um, y equals um, one over the norm of tx times tx. Okay. So um, then I obtained that um, the norm of that's of y has norm one. The norm of y is equal to one because I just def assuming that tx is not equal to zero. Okay. If okay, if tx is not equal to zero, we know that t is not the zero. We're going to assume that t is not the zero here. Okay, if t is the zero, obviously the norm of h is equal to the norm of t is equal to the zero. Okay, so then what do I get? I get the um, inner product of y and tx, okay, would equal to uh, tx tx over norm tx. Okay, which is equal to Tx norm. Okay. And now I'm going to take the soup over all that. The soup. So if I take this particular y sub x, okay, if I take now the soup over all norm x equal to 1, because I get to do that, right? The h of t is defined to be this soup. Now I'm going to take a particular y and show that the soup comes up to norm t, right? The soup, take a particular y, the soup of this equals to this equals to the soup of, uh, I forgot to put my soup, norm x equal to 1. So, <clears throat> whatever I'm doing here is, is at most as big as the norm of ht, okay? Because I'm picking a particular y of norm 1, right? And I'm going to take all of x of norm 1 so that tx is unequal to 0, okay, also. Okay, I as well do that. This, this norm is equal to the norm of t, okay. So I've got, uh, so I have, um, I've come up to the norm of t, and I'm at most of the norm of t. Therefore, h of t is equal to the norm of t. Therefore, h of, I've got this also. h of t is greater than the norm of t. Hence, h sub t is equal to the norm of t. So, all this, the adjoint operator which you define now is equal to the norm of t. It's uniquely determined in terms of t. There's only one adjoint. It's linear and bounded. It satisfies this equality, y tx equals t star y x for all x and h1 and all y and h2. Okay. By the way, this inner product is, in, of course, in the h1. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. So. Oh. Uh, Okay. Notice that that's not a contradiction of what we were doing before because the roles of H1 and H2 were switched. So this H2 was really the H1 of before, okay? <laughs> okay. Which never appeared, okay, because we never defined it this way. Okay, we never defined a such collinear form in terms of the inner product until this step, okay? And then we got um, represented whatever the such collinear form was in terms of the inner product of the other, of the second factor. Okay, or oh, the second factor. Okay, okay. So, by a little bit of magic of flipping <laughs> x's and y's, hopefully, if you're if you have the good right brain, you're probably not bothered at all. <laughs> if you're like me, this is like, huh. Oh. <laughs> okay. Anyway. <laughs> or maybe it's the connection between the right and the left. I'm not sure what that is. Okay. <laughs> it's the uh, corpus callosum or whatever the hell that's called. The thing that goes in between <laughs> the left and the right. Okay. Don't ask me. Okay, so you have the Hilbert adjoint. Now, what are the properties of it? It's very nice. And also, you can, 
So you get to switch the sides. Obviously, by taking conjugation, uh, I can put I can put the tx over here, so I can either write it as tx comma y equals uh, x t star y. Okay, I can write it that way because I can just switch these. If this is equal to this, then by taking conjugates, I can get it this way or the other way. So you did, the t basically goes from one the t you just basically take the operator from one side of the inner product to the other side of the inner product and put a star on it, or vice versa. You know, just take it either way you want. Okay. Okay. Adjoint. So there's not like you have to always go one way or something. <clears throat> now, what are the properties? There's a whole list of properties, and I'm only going to go through a little bit of it because uh, just to give the flavor of it. Okay. Um. Okay. <coughs> Properties. There's also a lemma in here, which is a zero operator, which is pretty important. Um, but I'm going to skip that for now. So let's go to the properties. I'll come back because I'm not going to need that. I don't think I'm going to need that. 3.9 dash 3. I don't think I need that to get the properties, most of them. Uh, let me see. Okay. Oh, they do use 393A. 393A. They don't use 393B ever. Okay. Well, okay. He's saying the obvious. Okay. This is again a real a restatement of uh, the lemma we had before, but there's one interesting statement. Okay, let me let me go ahead and state this lemma just just for lemma on the zero operator. The second part of this lemma was actually an exercise way back when in section three point. Two, I think. Okay, I think I told you. I said, oh, I don't think I could do the exercise. <laughs> it was done in this theorem. Um, a is that um, Q. Let's say so. I'm going to assume that Q is mapping some inner product space to another inner product space um, as a bonilinear operator. Okay, and these are inner product spaces. Q equals to zero, the zero operator, if and only if the inner product of QX with Y is equal to zero for all X in X and Y in Y. And of course, this is the inner product in the second inner product space. Okay. Actually, X wouldn't have to be an inner product space, it looks like. You tell the second part of the Theorem. So this is exactly as we had before. Okay. If this is equal to zero for all x and all y, then taking y equal to qx, I get qx inner product qx equal to zero. So qx is equal to zero for all x. All right. The same exact idea. This is just a trivial proof for a. B is a little bit more difficult. Let's say if, if q maps x to x. <laughs> Only so we only have one inner product space where x is complex, and that's necessary assumption. Then, if I have the qx inner product x equal to zero for all x, then q is equal to zero. Of course, if Q is equal to zero, then the inner product is equal to zero also. But the implication is if Q, if the inner product of QX with X is equal to zero for all X, then Q is zero if X is complex. And the counterexamples, if it's not complex, uh, what you can do is you can take, if you just have the real um, R2, and you take a 90 degree rotation, 
that's a linear operator from R2 to R2. That you get rotation, okay? Well, that will take, that'll take, for example, on R2 complex necessary for B. Because if I take R2 and I map Q, R2 to R2, by, let's say, uh, C1, C2, goes to minus C2, C1, which is the 90 degree rotation, then obviously uh, the inner product of these two things is zero, okay? C1, C2, dot product with minus C2, C1 is equal to zero, all right? for all the time. In other words, if you take the image vector, use 90 degree rotated from the original vector, dot product is zero. Okay? So you get this zero for all vectors in your real space. That, that obviously, that's not the zero operator. Okay? It's rotating. Okay? 90 degree rotation. You can check with the rotation matrix that this is the actual transformation that you would get. Okay? Okay. So that's kind of an interesting thing. And I'll skip the proof for now. Okay? I want to go on to the properties of the adjoint. Okay. So you're going to apply this, this 393A a bunch of times to get all the properties. What's one of them? 6C on the properties on page 198. Let's have a look at that. It says if I take alpha t and take the adjoint of that, then that's equal to alpha bar t star. Okay, that looks pretty easy. Okay, let's have a look at that. So there's all these properties. Um, take an easy one. Check it. Suppose so I take the scalar multiple of my t and then take the adjoint of that. Right, if I take alpha, if I have t, I can always take a scalar multiple of t and get another linear operator, right? And I'll take the adjoint of that. What's that? It? That's supposed to be equal to page 198, 6c. That's supposed to be, basically the idea is take the star on each term in reverse order, but this is a scalar, so it doesn't matter if I put it on the right or the left. So this will give me alpha bar t star, okay? Remember, a star was conjugate transpose. The transpose of a scalar is, doesn't give you anything new. Okay. So how do you check that? How would you check it? Well, you're going to use this basic lemma and this property of moving things across the side of the inner product. So what you do is you say, okay, alpha t star y comma x. Look at this expression. Okay, this is equal to, according to the definition of the adjoint, I can just take the star off if I move the alpha t over to the x. All right, so this is y inner product alpha t applied to x. Now I can take the alpha out by linearity, right? So this is equal to alpha bar y inner product tx. Get rid of the alpha. Well, that is, take it outside the inner product. Now, apply the adjoint again. So I get the t star on the other side, alpha bar, t star y, x. Now put the alpha back inside, which is alpha bar, t star, y, comma, x. Okay? And now that's true for all x and y, so by limit 393a, we're done. For all x in H1, for all y in H2. Okay. So, oh, that's QED. Okay, QED by 393A. Okay, what's another example? 
There was something to do with the quality of norms. That's kind of tricky. Um, proof of 6E, I think that might be interesting to look at anyway. Um, the claim is that the norm of T star T is equal to the norm of T T star, which is equal to the norm of T, the, the square on the outside. That's 6E, I believe. Yes. Okay. Um, here, in this case, what we're doing is that, let's see, um, does this make sense? If T is mapping H1 to H2, H, T star is mapping H2 back to H1, so this is the norm of an operator from H1 to H1. This is the norm of an operator from H2 to H2. Okay. T star would map, you see, T is mapping H1 to H2, bonded linear operator, then automatically T star maps H2 back to H1, bonded linear operator. And so in this context, all, all this, these all make sense. These compositions make sense. Okay. T would go from H1, and then T star would take it back to H1. If I started with T star, I'd go to H1, and then I'd follow with T and get back to H2. And then T's... Uh, Happy H1 to H2. Okay? So, how would you prove that? Okay? Well, first, um, you would just take, I guess the starting point is proof. The norm of Tx squared is equal to the norm of T, the inner product of Tx with itself. Okay, now you get to move one of those Ts, right? <laughs> okay. So this is equal to, let's just move the second one over, t star t, x with x, which is obviously less than or equal to the norm of t star t. Uh, well, okay, what is it? This is Cauchy-Schwartz. What I'm going to do is Cauchy-Schwartz. Cauchy-Schwartz. Remember, you work with the inner product. You always use Cauchy Schwartz. Cauchy Schwartz gives you everything you want. You always get the inequality plus you can get equality, right? Uh, as long as you can make these two vectors parallel. Okay, but here I'm just trying to get the inequality. Cauchy Schwartz, let's think of T star, T, T star X times norm X, which is in turn less than or equal to T, the norm of T star T times the norm of X times the norm of x again. Okay, here I'm just working, I'm not working with norm x of norm 1, let's say. But then, the, now I will. Okay, hence, if I take norm of tx squared divided by x squared, I get that's less than or equal to the norm of t star t. And therefore, taking soup, I get that the norm of t squared is less than or equal to the norm of t star t. Okay, so I have one thing. I've got this thing less than or equal to the first thing. Okay, now I want to get a reverse. Here. Now I want to get some kind of reverse inequality. Okay. Um, but, indeed, um, okay. So I've got that part. So now, what do I have? I have also that um, the norm of, but on the other hand, I have the norm of t squared. So I, so therefore, the norm of t squared is less than or equal to um, t star t. This is just what I had before. Rewrite. Okay, what I just had. Now, the, the norm of products is less than the product of norms. We've done that in here before, a long time ago. Less than or equal to the product of norms. I think I did. At least I did it in the notes. It's easy to show. Okay. 
and the norm of t star is equal to the norm of t, so that's equal to the norm of t times the norm of t, okay, which is the norm of t squared again. So I've verified now, therefore, uh, the, the, the norm of t star t is equal to the norm of t squared. The norm of t, the quantity squared. So therefore, the norm of t squared is equal to the norm of t star t. This is just kind of playing around. They give you some of the things you can play with. Okay? Um, and now you can also do this middle inequality. Why? Because if you take the double star, that's equal to t. <laughs> okay? So you now you just now you basically say, but now but now apply with t star in place of t. Okay, and you get the norm of t star squared is equal to the norm of t double star t star. But the norm, t double star is t. So this is equal to t, t star, and the norm of t star squared is just the norm of t squared, because t star has the same norm as t. Okay. So the norm of t squared equal to the norm of t star, the norm is squared is equal to the norm of t, t star. Okay, so that's the end of that business. I think you could probably do most of any of these uh, with enough playing around. Okay. Um, a couple extra properties that we need to have. So now, instead of having, I'm going to take a mapping from H back to H, which is going to be more typical. And um, what does it mean for an operator? In that case, I can talk about self-adjoint. T star equal to T. So uh, let now T map H to H be a bounded linear operator. Okay, and then um, we have also T star, that's H to H. Okay, uh, T is said to be self-adjoint if T equals to T star if it's the same mapping. Okay, and there's also a definition of unitary and normal in the same thing because it's uh, all involving the definition. T is unitary if T star is equal to T inverse, if T, uh, if T is invertible and T star is equal to T inverse, and T is normal. I don't really know that. Well, there's some exercises that show you why T would be called normal if T star T equals T T star. Okay. Can we kind of just get that and then... We didn't have definition of unit. Unitary you probably had in, in math uh, 313 if you talked about complex matrices at all. Okay. And you probably didn't talk about normal. But uh, So I'll, I'll just leave these. We're going to leave these for later. Okay. I'm not going to talk about them now. So what is self-adjoint? Okay. So 3103, there's a couple little lemmas on that. One. And these are very easy to prove also. A, if T is self-adjoint, then the inner product of Tx with X is non-negative. Well, excuse me, it's real. Not non-negative, it's real for all X and H. Okay. And B, if... On the other hand, you can you can have the converse. 
if T, if, if in the case of a Hilbert space that's complex, if H is complex, here's where we're going to use that uh, lemma 393B. If H is complex and Tx inner product with X is real for all X, then T is self-adjoint. Okay. So that would be for only the complex case. So how do you prove A? Well, how do you prove B? Let's do B because we're almost out of time. Okay, B. If TXX is equal to the conjugate of TXX, that's the assumption. Okay, because you're saying that TXX is real, so it's equal to its conjugate. Then, what do you have? You have TX inner product with X is equal to X T star X, because that's always true, and then I can put the conjugate there, okay, because it's real. But then, obviously, I can put that to the, I can get rid of the conjugate and move it back to the other side, so therefore that's equal to TXX oh, with a star here. Okay, so now I have TXX equals to T star XX. Well, therefore, if I put Q equal to the difference of the left side, to put Q equal to T minus T star, okay, then what I'm saying is that QXX is equal to zero for all X, and uh, Hilbert H is complex. Therefore, by 393B, which I didn't prove yet, we'll just we'll give a little proof next time, I guess. Therefore, by 393B, uh, Q is equal to the zero operator. The zero operator. If you have a complex Hilbert space, then this is enough to show that Q is equal to zero. So T equals T star. Okay. It's off a joint. So you have some interesting exercises involving this this uh, this T star. You may want to be asking about some of those. So have a look at it because you see the homework is either do Thursday if you <laughs> you can't turn it in on Monday, or it's due Monday. Okay. So Thursday I would ask for questions about this. Okay. The test is going to be due March 21st. It's two weeks from today. I've extended the deadline to the Tuesday. It's a Tuesday, the week before spring break. So I, hope I might even get it back to you before spring break. If I really am dedicated. <laughs> okay. All right. But that would be the final, that's the final deadline for that paper. Okay, so I have to start having a look at that. No homework that, well, let's see. I guess I'm going to probably postpone the homework that would have been done the week before uh, the break to the Tuesday after the break because you it was already extended to the Monday after the break by this new rule anyway. So I'm just pushing everything back a little bit and making Tuesday essentially the, the new due date. Monday, Tuesday, you know. Okay. You're not here on Mondays anyway. I'm not here on Mondays. That's why I don't get your homework to grade it.